Well, I wanted to welcome you to Friday afternoon, June 19th. Uh, in part, I want to have just a little bit of discussion or give you some feedback and kind of continue our conversation that we've had online about some of the issues for the reading from this past week, which you know we identified at the beginning of the week was really going to be a struggle. Um, ethics and models of ethics clearly is very difficult, and clearly reading what we've read poses a whole lot of, of difficulty in trying to ferret out how we understand the different authors and even the mixed messages of, of different authors about authors. Um, one of the things that I would re suggest you do from time to time when you come up across a, a particular model or word or, or approach that you don't understand, do one of the things that I do um, and one of the things that um, my uh, good advisor Liz Poy suggests that I do, plug that, that phrase, plug that issue into Google and see what you come up with. And that also might help explain some of the uh, words that did you come across in terms of the discussion about ethics. I'm going to actually try and talk about a little bit of that today. One of the questions that I that we read about this week and we tried to struggle was the issue issue of charity and social justice. Um, and we, I asked you actually to make a decision about how you were going to distribute resources. And for many of us, the issue of social justice and and defining charity is incredibly complex. In terms of, and so I would ask back to you, why is it sometimes that we think about the provision of medical care or uh, particular types of medical care as charity? So why do we have fundraising races for breast cancer? Um, why is it that uh, we just assume that snow removal, and I wrote this on, um, on our class folder, that snow removal should be paid for out of public funds? Why and how do we make those decisions? Um, and what does it do to the individual and or the circumstance when we place that individual in a charity case? And what does it mean for us in terms of ethics? What does it mean for us in terms of a model of distribution distribution of resources? What approach are you adopting when we decide that um, it's okay to service people at a soup kitchen versus assuring that people have adequate uh, foodstuffs. Now this is not something that I'm really going to expect an answer and we may all come away from this with different opinions. Um, we're all used to walking into many of our supermarkets or other stores and seeing that container collecting funds for somebody who just got burned out from their house. Um, why is that okay? And why is that an approach now? Um, versus approaches in the past that might have had communities responding to just rebuilding because that's what they did. That's what they wanted to do. A couple of uh, questions came up in the reading and I really want to respond to provide some definitions of that and these are taken from the web. One of the questions is somebody asked a little bit more about what do we mean by situation or situational ethics. Um, it really, and this is from the web, it's a consequential theory, we read about that, in that it's concerned with the outcome or consequences of an action. The end, as opposed to an action being intrinsically wrong, such as the denotological theories, in this case of situational ethics, the ends can justify the means. And we hear that from time to time, that, you know, so whatever you, however this, that good gets distributed, that that's okay, however people get resources. Um, in terms of thinking about an obligation to duty with deontological ethics is an approach to ethics that holds that the acts are inherently good or evil regardless of the consequences. So my behavior, the behavior of other people becomes important. A central theme among these theorists is that we have a duty to do those things that are inherently good. As example would be truth telling. It's our responsibility to be truthful. While the ends or consequences of our actions are important, our obligation or duty is to take the right action, even if the consequences of a given action may be bad. So that provides us with a, um, I think, an, an important kind of contrast there for us to think about a little bit. Um, the issue of differing definitions of disability posed a number of, of dilemmas for us in terms of thinking about the issue of disability, natural endowments, personal gifts. How do we differentiate that? 
in that with non-talent, where do individuals with those characteristics fit within our society? And I've often thought, um, we talk oftentimes in our disability studies class about the issue about what's the role and place of higher education. I wrote about this, but and I know it's one of the issues that uh, Liz and I um, have talked about from time to time. It's that issue of what should be the role of the University of Maine. Um, does it matter if we open up classes to anybody and everybody and they can just come and sit there whether or not there's an intention down the road that the person is going to be capable of getting a degree? Um, do, what kind of resources do we have to provide for somebody who is just not talented? I can't play a musical instrument for uh, a hill of beans. I'm probably not even great at turning on the radio and keeping that um, in a in a sound manner. But um, so what if in that terms of that non-talent? Um, what if I wanted to enroll in in a music class? What what would or should be uh, the role of the instructor in that situation? Should that be something that I can do? And what's okay about endowments or natural endowments or talents, um, a personal gifts? Um, do we not acknowledge that when that when we when the individual has personal gifts in one area or natural endowments to do that? Um, do we try and level if we level out the playing field? Is that not is that not acknowledging that? I'm not really sure, and I think that that's a struggle for us um, in higher education. It's a struggle for us when we begin thinking about issues of accommodation, issues of universal access, and. So you raise a really uh, important issue in terms of talking about, boy, do we respond to the individual or what about modifying the physical, social, virtual environment and what are the changes? And I often think about that in terms of what are the barriers at times to us doing that. And, and in part it may be that it's just because we've always done it this way before. Rooms have always been set up this way. We haven't always provided... Um, microphones. And so part of the difficulty may be for us, as, we, as we've talked about from time to time, is flipping our brain and thinking about what it means when we see society and see our communities differently, and not just responding to the individual, which I, at times I think about universal design as almost being a euphemism for accommodation. So I'm going to respond to do universal design for folks identified as disabled, but um, I don't have that obligation for other people in, in society as a general. And perhaps if we rethink that issue and rethink about what it means to be a community member, regardless of your circumstances, um, that uh, might change how we think about issues of accommodation um, and issues of a universal design and just the construction of our communities in general. One thing before I go, um, Hume clearly uh, raise a number of issues for people. Um, and let me just kind of uh, identify that Hume really is an Enlightenment empiricist. And so go back and look what the Enlightenment being, you know, kind of the history of moving forth of, of kind of science that suggests that there has to be some type of motivation in ethical decision making, but that the motivation does not have to be logical. It just has to be apparent in the person making the decision. So however that plays out, determines the ethical position and actions from there. And as usual, when I struggle with these ethical things, I, I frequently turn to Liz DePoy, who's got a much better grasp on this. This is difficult work. These are complicated issues. Um, I hope that the readings that you'll be reading beginning this weekend and the PowerPoints, as well as the two videos that I'm going to post this weekend, will allow us to kind of make some application of these. Um, at any rate, I will talk to you all soon, whether it's um, online uh, on our YouTube or um, by written communication. Anyway, have a good weekend. Talk to you soon. Thank you.